You are traveling through another dimension, a dimension full of space mysteries. It is the middle ground between science and superstition, between dark matter and black holes. And it lies between the dark depths of our solar system's planets and the distant stars beyond Hubble's reach. It is a dimension we will explore tonight together. There's a signpost up ahead. Your next stop, the Twilight Stream. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Planetarium live stream. Hope you enjoyed that throwback. Uh, and to celebrate our spooky Halloween month, we're going to do uh, a little throwback to our uh, topic, topic that we covered back in October of 2020. We're going to be looking at some different space mysteries, um, some spooky things happening around the universe. Uh, first of all, though, uh, my name is Patrick Hess. I'm the Planetarium Manager at Union Station. If you're tun tuning in for the first time, welcome. Happy to have you joining us. We're going to be going over a little fall star tour preview of what's up in our night skies this season. And then, like I said, we're going to be diving into some space mysteries in celebration of Halloween. This is our 97th live stream, so if you're our first time watcher, um, we have recordings of all of our past live streams on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash KC Planetarium. Be sure to check those out. Um, we've got some curated playlists of a lot of fun different topics we've covered over the past three plus years uh, and over 80 hours of content for you to check out there. So definitely check that out. And this is a live stream, so if you're watching on October 30th, 2023 at 6 p.m. Central, then uh, let us know in the comments. We'd love to hear from our watchers and viewers uh, and let us know where you're watching from. And of course, if you have any questions during tonight's stream, uh, we've got one of our top fans, Tammy, tuning in uh, from very cold Iowa. It's cold here in Kansas City too, Tammy, but we're happy to see you uh, tonight and I hope you enjoyed tonight's show. Um, as normal, we're gonna do some light housekeeping uh, to start out with so uh, let's head on over here and check out some announcements uh, going on around the planetarium we do have a few more uh, evening laser shows available this fall so be sure uh, to uh, check those out um, we've got Aerosmith uh, and uh, we've also got a laser Floyd night at the end of November and to celebrate Taylor Swift's birthday on uh, December 13th, we'll be having a few laser Taylor Swift shows. So tickets are available. Um, I've been checking uh, the attendance or pre-sale numbers, and we've got plenty of tickets left for Laser Aerosmith. Apparently, they had to reschedule their farewell tour stop in KC. So if you were hoping to check that out, um, but we're looking for something else to do uh, until they come up with a new date, then tickets are available. That's November 11th. Then November 24th and 25th is Laser Floyd. Uh, there are still some tickets available for those, but we do anticipate they may be selling out. And then Laser Taylor Swift on December, December 13th. So be sure to check those out too. So we're going to jump right in to our first portion of tonight's stream. Uh, first of all, though, we've got a comment from Jerry, another one of our top viewers and fans, saying hello. Thanks for watching tonight, Jerry. <laughs> My, it's nice to know that we'll definitely have a few of our uh, familiar faces for all of our streams, uh, including Eric, uh, who's saying howdy from Lenexa. Thanks for watching tonight, Dad. Hope you enjoy the show. Uh, and if you have any questions, let me know. So um, because we haven't done it in a little while and because we are heading towards our final live stream, that's right, this is our 97th live stream and we're going to end at 100 next spring and that'll be uh, celebrating our fourth anniversary of doing these live streams. Um, but it has been a little while so we want to do a little uh, preview of our fall night skies uh, since we haven't looked at the night sky or star tours since the summertime. Uh, and so uh, let's uh, check that out. So what is going on? Uh, oh, uh, one more quick plug I should mention. Um, we do have tickets available for our holiday schedule, and we are bringing back our uh, holiday shows, including Laser Holiday Magic and our uh, holiday-themed star tour, Stars of Faith. So be sure to check that out. Uh, tickets are available. That'll be starting the Friday before Thanksgiving. So like I said, let's see what's up in our night skies. And we're going to start out by looking at our calendar of planets. Uh, this is a nice little chart that tells us what planets are going to be visible at what times uh, of the morning or evening during this year. And we're going to preview November here, and we can see that Mercury is going to be uh, a little bit visible at dusk. Um, it's a bit hard to spot, though, since it is so close to the sun and so faint. So unless you're far away from the city lights, you probably won't see it. 
Venus right now is our morning star, so the brightest point of light you'll see in the early morning. That will probably be Venus. Uh, and then we've got Jupiter gracing our night skies all night long right now. In fact, uh, this coming week is Jupiter's opposition when it will be closest to the Earth in its orbit. And we're actually going to be celebrating uh, at Union Station. We'll be having a telescope viewing event on Thursday night, and that is a member-exclusive event. So if you're a Union Station member or know anybody who's a Union Station member, you can um, reserve your spot for that special event. Uh, so we'll be looking at Jupiter through a telescope. Uh, as well as Saturn, which is visible in the evening, it'll be setting uh, a little after midnight, so we're starting to, to lose sight of Saturn, but it is still shining uh, prominently. Uh, and then Uranus and Neptune, those planets aren't visible with the naked eye, uh, but um, if you do have a powerful enough telescope, they will be up this evening as well. Uh, another little space update is that a week or so ago, we did have a total or not a total, excuse me, an annular solar eclipse. Uh, and for a certain part of the country, um, we were able to actually see the moon pass in front of the sun. Now this is what we call an annular eclipse. It's not a total eclipse. Annular refers to uh, a ring, and we can actually see that in this case, the moon was a little bit too far away for it to cover the sun entirely. Um, and so if you happen to be in the path of totality, um, which uh, for this one, uh, happened to cross sort of through the southwest part of the country. And then you could see this, uh, they call it a ring of fire. Now here in Kansas City, we would have seen a partial eclipse where the moon partially covered the sun. It was totally overcast that day though, so we saw nothing here in Kansas City. But have no fear, uh, we do, we are expecting uh, a total solar eclipse visible next year. That'll be next April, April 8th, Monday, April 8th. So mark your calendars and that will be uh, the path of totality. We'll be passing through uh, southern Missouri. So we're pretty close uh, if you wanted to check out that eclipse. Uh, but if you were around town um, a few weeks ago uh, on the uh, 14th, I believe, October 14th it was. Unfortunately, it was totally overcast, so we didn't get a chance to see it. Uh, Jerry in the comments says the laser show is phenomenal, assuming you're referring to our laser holiday magic show. It's a fun one, and we're happy to bring it back. And we've got Lauren, my mother, who is watching along with my grandmother uh, and her friend Nancy watching from Lakeview. Well, Granny and Nancy, thanks for watching tonight. And let me know if you have any questions. I'm sure my mom can help uh, you figure out the Facebook comments section. Uh, so uh, what else is up in our night sky right now? So let's jump over to... A Stellarium, which is our home planet, virtual planetarium software, where we're looking at over the Kansas City skyline here on the steps of the Liberty Memorial. And the sun is already setting. In fact, uh, right now is pretty much sunset. The sun is on its way below the horizon. Uh, and um, I'm uh, checking my fancy watch here that's going to tell me that the sun will finish setting at about 6.40, so while we're on the stream. Uh, unfortunately, though, I believe it's this weekend, but daylight savings time will be over, which means we are going to lose an hour and the sun will be setting even earlier. So starting a week from now, the sun will be setting at around 5 o'clock. But that's great news for stargazing because as soon as that sun sets, the stars come out. And also in the fall, there's less heat radiating off of the ground, and that heat uh, often causes uh, disruptions in our viewing ability in the summertime. Also, there's some really awesome deep space objects visible in the winter, which we will look at. But for now, we're going to go ahead and fast forward time and get that sun to set. And we're going to go about an hour past sunset so we can get rid of most of the twilight. So at around 7.30, you'll see a lovely view of the stars. Now, this is a view of the stars where we turned all the lights off in Kansas City. And so there's no light pollution. But if you're far away from the city lights, this is a similar view that you'll see. We're facing north right now. And of course, we see the familiar dippers the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper, which are visible every season, but uh, they'll be low in the horizon in the winter here in Kansas City. So it's kind of hard to see the constellation patterns that uh, make up uh, the Dippers, but those are uh, the constellations uh, Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, uh, the Big Bear and the Little Bear. And so Ursa Major is kind of hard to spot in the fall since its legs are getting close to the horizon. Uh, and that's where the light pollution is worse, near the horizon. Um, but we can see those bears. In the comments, we've got Melanie watching from Florida. Thanks for tuning in tonight. And Liz is watching from Overland Park. Thanks for watching, both of you. Let me know if you have any questions during tonight's show. So I usually like to go over towards the west to see what we are losing in our uh, evening sky, what will be setting in the early fall skies. 
Um, and there's a very bright star that is setting over here. This is the star Arcturus, um, which is the second brightest star in our night sky. The brightest star in the night sky will be rising in about a month or a little bit past sunset. I'll point it out for us tonight. Uh, Arcturus is part of a constellation that looks kind of like a little ice cream cone. Um, its name is Buotes. Uh, he was a hunter that was said to be chasing the Ursa bears through the sky. Uh, Arcturus means watcher of the bear in ancient Greek. Now, a little bit higher in our sort of southwest sky, you'll find three bright stars that are forming a nice big triangle. Uh, we call this the Summer Triangle. Uh, it's a famous star pattern that is more prominent in our summer skies, and it'll be setting in the fall. Um, in the springtime, these three stars rise one at a time, one after another, and as soon as all three are up after sunset, that tells you summer is here. A little way to track the changing seasons. There's a pretty cool deep space object uh, between these two stars. Uh, well, first of all, I should point out that this, this little diamond shape right here next to the brightest star in the Summer Triangle, uh, this is the constellation Lyra, the harp. Uh, this harp belonged to Orpheus, a legendary uh, poet and prophet. But the reason I want to point it out is because there's a deep space object near this uh, constellation. And it's between these two stars in the harp. And if we zoom in here, it will show up in... Stellarium, and there it is. Now, this object is called the Ring Nebula. It's a what's called a planetary nebula, which is the remnants of a dead star. So when uh, stars get old, they'll uh, sort of slowly expand, expelling their elements, uh, leaving behind these rings of different colors of gas. Now, this is a really fuzzy picture, uh, and this picture was taken actually uh, before the Hubble Space Telescope was sent to space. Now, Hubble has taken other pictures of the Ring Nebula, but I wanted to bring this up because just a few weeks ago, the James Webb Space Telescope took a picture of the Ring Nebula. And this is going to be rotated a little bit, but you'll see that the Webb Space Telescope's uh, power is a little bit of an upgrade versus uh, uh, Hubble, or, well, versus this imagery and then even Hubble. This is... Uh, Quite a beautiful image of the Ring Nebula. You can see all that amazing detail that Webb provides. So I just want to bring that up since that is something that's up in our current night sky that Webb uh, did recently capture. We actually dive into uh, even greater detail during our seasonal star tour right now, talking about the Ring Nebula and this brand new imagery. But I just want to point that out uh, near this oops, summer triangle. Um, now the Liberty Memorial is blocking our view a little bit, so we're going to move our view a bit further away from Kansas City to a more, more rural perspective. Now there's a famous star pattern called the Teapot right here. It's not an official constellation, but it is a famous pattern that a lot of people are familiar with. The Teapot's handle is right here, and there's its slid and the spout. Now this part, or this const sorry, this star pattern is part of the constellation Sagittarius, the Centaur. Now that teapot is also a useful tool for finding the Milky Way, which we can see stretching up from the southwest sky right now. Summer and fall is the best time to view the Milky Way, but in the coming uh, weeks and months, the Milky Way will be uh, out of sight and a little bit harder to spot. Uh, summer In the summer and fall, we are facing towards the center of our galaxy, where it's a lot brighter. Now, continuing over to the southeast are a pair of planets um, first of all, in the southeast up here is the planet Saturn. It's in the constellation Aquarius right now. We can zoom in on Saturn here. Saturn right now is the ninth brightest point of light in the sky. And we can see Saturn and a few of its moons nearby. Now Saturn is... Um, well, any of the planets that we see in our night sky, you'll notice that unlike the stars around them, the planets don't twinkle, and Stellarium is even kind of simulating that twinkling, so you can see the stars twinkling next to it, but this planet does not twinkle. Uh, stars twinkle because they're really far away from Earth, and only a tiny amount of their light is able to penetrate the Earth's atmosphere, and that's why stars twinkle. Planets are a lot closer than stars, so more of their light is reflected back towards Earth, and uh, they are not as disrupted by our atmosphere. So that's how you can tell the difference between a star and a planet. Um, and then we have Jupiter, which will be the brightest point of light you'll see in the early night sky tonight. And that is that bright orange or yellow point of light over in the east. 
Now, if we zoom in on Jupiter, as I said before, it is the closest that it usually gets in its orbital path right now uh, to the Earth. And we can see a number of its moons lined up next to it. These are what's called the Galilean moons, and that's because these moons were observed by Galileo Galilei when he first observed uh, Jupiter through his telescope. We can see three of them right now, but there is a fourth uh, likely hiding behind Jupiter. These moons are called Ganymede, Europa, Callisto, and Io. These are only some of Jupiter's moons, though, and we'll talk about the planetary moons uh, in a little bit later. James and Donna are watching from KCK. Thanks for tuning in tonight, guys. And Tammy's asking, how old can stars get? Uh, Tammy, that's a really great question. So, um, some stars can get really old. Our sun, for example, which is sort of an average-sized star, uh, our sun right now is about four and a half billion years old, and we expect for it to continue burning for another four or so billion years. So normal-sized stars usually burn for about 10 billion years. That's with a B. Um, now, if a star is a lot larger than our sun, though, uh, it often won't burn for nearly as long. Uh, actually, it'll only burn for a few million years, and that's because it's so heavy that um, it burns through its fuel very, very quickly, and it also will reach a point where it will no longer be able to keep itself together because it's so heavy, and it will go supernova. It'll explode. Um, so those stars, those are what we call uh, like blue giant stars, um, or uh, Arcturus, I believe, is... Uh, a uh, star of a similar age. I guess I'll, I can I can bring it up and double check. <laughs> uh, so Arcturus is, let's see. Um, well, actually, no. Arcturus is a is a uh, red giant star, so it's a very old star. Um, but there are other stars. A star we'll talk about a little bit later when we're talking about space mysteries. Um, some stars will burn for not nearly, nearly as long. So that's a great question, Tammy. Uh, so in terms of fall constellations, uh, there is a constellation near Saturn tonight called Aquarius, the water bearer. Now let me bring our stars back over here. So we're looking towards the southeast where we can see um, the planet Saturn. Now we can see another bright star down here called uh, Fomalox, which is part of Pisces Australis, that's the southern fish. <laughs> um, but above these, uh, the star and Saturn is Aquarius. So Aquarius kind of looks like a stick figure from the side. Um, this little oval shape right here is Aquarius's head. And here's Aquarius's torso and his legs. And his arm is over here and he's kind of holding a bowl of water that he's pouring out into the sky. Now, Aquarius uh, began his life as a young prince named Ganymede. Ganymede is the name of one of Jupiter's moons, by the way. Uh, in the stories from Greek mythology, they said that Ganymede was kidnapped by the gods at one point and brought up to Mount Olympus to serve them as their cupbearer, someone to bring them their wine. One day, though, when Ganymede noticed that the people of, people of Earth were in the midst of a drought, he poured his cup down to Earth to end the drought and bring rains. And the gods were so impressed by his kindness that they decided to turn him into Aquarius, the god of rain. Now, I'll give a little preview, fast forwarding to our later winter skies, because the fall skies aren't super interesting at the moment, uh, but there are some other very interesting star patterns rising just a little bit later tonight. And especially as we, um, as the sun sets even earlier, we'll be able to see these earlier too. So right now, rising around midnight, is a group of very famous constellations. Uh, of course, there's the moon, too. Uh, right now, the moon is in a waning gibbous phase. Waning means that the moon is getting less brighter, uh, and gibbous means that the moon is more than half full, but it's not quite completely full. Above the moon, we have a famous star cluster visible in the fall and winter. This is the Pleiades Cluster. It's called the Seven Sisters because most people can see six or seven stars there with the naked eye. But as we zoom in, we can see that this is a massive star cluster containing about a thousand stars. These stars are also all siblings. They were all born together from the same nebula. We can see the leftovers of that nebula. It's these little wispy tendrils of blue light, which are reflecting the light from these young stars. Star clusters like Pleiades are useful tools to astronomers uh, because they help us to understand the evolution and lifespans of stars. By studying stars that are all around the same age, we can learn a lot about the stages of their development. Now below uh, 
the uh, Pleiades star cluster, we have a bright V pattern in the sky, and this is the head of Taurus the bull, a famous winter constellation. This bull represents a disguise taken by Zeus, the king of the gods, uh, when he came down to Earth to mess around with mortals. He often disguised himself as various animals and creatures. And then below Taurus is Orion, probably the most famous winter constellation and one of the most famous of all. Uh, it's the brightest constellation in the night sky, uh, if you combine the brightness of all of its stars. Of course, we have Orion's famous belt, outlined by these four stars. Uh, Orion's feet are down here. Here are his shoulders. This little cluster of stars is his head, and in one hand he's holding a bow or a shield, and the other is raising a club or a sword. Orion was a famous hunter from Greek mythology, uh, and uh, Orion is uh, one of my fa favorite constellations, mostly because it has my favorite deep space object. Now below Orion's belt is a smaller group of three dimmer stars. Some people call this his dagger or his sword hilt. But this part of the constellation is hiding the Orion Nebula. This is a star forming region where new stars are being born. This gas and dust is getting pulled together by gravity uh, where new stars are being birthed inside uh, this beautiful space object. Now we're, we dive in more depth to the Orion Nebula. We even fly to it in 3D at the planetarium during our winter star tour. So I encourage you to come back to the planetarium and check out our Stars of Faith show because we'll dive into greater depth about uh, the origins of stars and our universe. I think that about does it for what I want to talk about uh, for our uh, little star tour portion of, portion of tonight's stream. So we're going to move right along to Space Mysteries. So for tonight's show, I want to dive into some of my favorite space mysteries um, from around the universe. What are some mysterious things that are stumping astronomers and scientists to this day? Uh, we did this stream once before, all the way back in October of 2020. Uh, and I'm going to cover a few of those uh, mysteries that I still find interesting and that I've, I'm adding some detail to. Um, but also, we're actually going to revisit one of these space mysteries because it's sort of a mystery that's been solved since then in the past three years. So that's kind of exciting. And it actually has to do with that constellation, Orion. Uh, now, the star in the lower right-hand corner is named Rigel. And this is a blue supergiant star. Uh, Tammy was asking earlier about uh, some stars that or how old stars get, and this star, Rigel, will likely be burning out in a few million years. Uh, and then another star in the upper left-hand corner of Orion uh, is the star Betelgeuse. Now, Betelgeuse was in the news back in 2019 and 2020, and we covered it, or we included it as one of our space mysteries back then. Uh, Betelgeuse is the 10th brightest star in the night sky. Uh, there it is in the, on the left shoulder of Orion. And it's about 650 light years away, and it'll be visible a little bit later this year, as I mentioned, or later tonight, if you stay up late. Um, but the interesting thing about Betelgeuse is that back in December of 2019, we observed Betelgeuse fading. Now, Betelgeuse often does fade, um, but uh, it, we, we can track that fading. Um, and actually, I want to rewind a little bit. So I mentioned that uh, Betelgeuse is a red supergiant. So uh, let's go back to my presentation here. Um, so to put it into perspective just how big Betelgeuse is, here's a cool animation um, that was uh, produced uh, by some scientists. So we can see the sun here in relative size to uh, the orbits of the planets. But this right here is... Betelgeuse. This is how big Betelgeuse would be in relation to our solar system. So it would be so big it would absorb the orbits of all the inner planets uh, and it would uh, be very close to the orbit of Jupiter. So this is a gigantic star. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, let's go next. Uh, Betelgeuse has been uh, changing its brightness. Um, back in 2019, we observed it fading, and here's um, some pictures between January 2019 and December 2019. And these are actual close-up photographs of Betelgeuse. Now, Betelgeuse fades in uh, relatively predictable frequencies. Um, it actually has a 400-day cycle where it gets brighter or darker. Um, and this was first observed all the way back in the 1830s by British astronomer John Herschel. 
Um, now, Betelgeuse is a red supergiant nearing the end of its life. It's only 8 million years old, but stars this massive often don't live as long, as I mentioned before. Um, it is expected to go supernova sometime in the next 100,000 years or so. So when we observed it getting darker than usual, uh, we speculated that it might actually be preparing to explode and go supernova, which is pretty exciting. Would, would have been pretty exciting. A supernova could have been visible to the naked eye, even in the middle of the day, and it would have changed our starscape. It would have changed the constellation Orion. Um, now, we would have been safe if it had gone supernova, uh, but it would have taken 100,000 years for this radiation to actually reach the Earth. And when it happened, our atmosphere would have protected us. And uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, by early 2020, it was approximately 25% of its usual brightness. And this was actually obvious to the naked eye. Uh, but bizarrely, by March 2020, it had brightened back up. Um, so uh, by tracking its brightness, we could see that it had kind of gone back to its uh, regular brightness frequency. And today, it still is just as bright. Uh, now, back in August of 2022, uh, a study using the Hubble Space Telescope confirmed that this dust was likely created uh, by a surface mass ejection, or SME. So what probably happened is that uh, there was a great mass ejecting from uh, the surface of Betelgeuse that caused a big cloud of dust to kind of make Betelgeuse appear a little bit dimmer. Uh, this produced shocks and pulsations that blasted off this chunk of its photosphere. This also left the star with a large, cool surface area under the dust cloud, um, called a sunspot, and so all this combined to make Betelgeuse look a little bit dimmer for a little while. But again, uh, this star did eventually recover and it has now resumed its expected brightness levels. This big chunk of matter that blew off of Betelgeuse though weighed roughly several, several times as much as our moon. Uh, and uh, this fractured piece of photosphere sped off into space and cooled to form a dust cloud that blocked the light from Betelgeuse as we observed from here on Earth. So there you go, space mystery solved. Just wanted to follow up with that uh, from our last space mystery live stream but what i mentioned this last time uh, that i wanted to bring up again is one of my favorite space mysteries and that is saturn's mysterious north pole hexagon uh now this was first observed observed by voyager uh, the voyager spacecraft back uh about 40 years ago when it first explored the outer planets it was photographed again though in much greater detail by the cassini spacecraft from 2006 to 2017 and we'll be looking at some of those photographs now it has shifted in color a bit um, from a mostly blue color to sort of a golden color during the course of uh, Cassini's mission. Each side of this hexagon is about 9,000 miles long, or about 12,000 miles longer than the diameter of the Earth. Now, this hexagon rotates about once every 10 hours, uh, and this is about the same periodicity as radio missions from Saturn's interior, which is kind of interesting. Now, there are a number of theories about what could be causing this distinctive hexagon shape, on the North Pole of Saturn. Could be due to a steep uh, latitudinal gradients uh, in the speed of atmospheric winds in Saturn's atmosphere. Uh, and this shape has been replicated in a lab actually using fluid dynamics and turbulent flow. Uh, here is uh, a simulation showing that shape being replicated. Other scientists have created the same effect though using a different aspect of fluid dynamics called vortex shedding. Uh, so there are a bunch of different theories some other theories about things called Rosby waves that create, create fluid, re, through fluid resonance similar to sound waves. Um, all these theories explain some of the hexag hexagonal shape, uh, but they fail to uh, demonstrate uh, certain aspects uh, uh, predicting other parts of the cloud pattern. So here's another uh, representation of these uh, uh, geometric vortexes being formed on Earth, which is kind of cool. So this is still a mystery. Uh, it's just cool thinking about how on a distant planet in our own solar system there is actually a, a geometric shape as distinctive as a hexagon. And there's a close-up of the hurricane at the center of that hexagon in false color, um, but I'll show off the hexagon again. But you can see those distinctive flat sides there. And this is only observed in the North Pole of Saturn. Another space mystery that has still not been solved is Saturn's disappearing moon, Peggy. Uh, not to be confused with uh, the one of the Schuyler sisters. Um, and this was first observed in 2013 by the Cassini spacecraft. Uh, here's a zoomed in uh, portion of Saturn's rings that show, and there, my head is right in front of it, I'll hide myself. Um, 
we can see uh, the tiny little blip there in Saturn's rings, and they named this little mass Peggy. Uh, it was about 1.2 miles wide, and it was near the edge of Saturn's A ring. It was named after the discovering astronomer's mother-in-law, who had her 88th birthday on the day that he found the moon. Uh, and at this time, it was thought that this was a new moon that was being formed. Now, there are a number of moons inside the rings of Saturn. We call them shepherd moons, and they often lie uh, here inside these gaps. Uh, and they're formed after gravity coalesces enough matter in those rings, forming big chunks of matter that sort of clear away a path around them. Uh, and uh, they sort of shepherd the rings of Saturn around as they orbit in those gaps. And so we thought that Peggy was maybe on its way to becoming another one of those shepherd moons. But a year later, Cassini looked at the same place, uh, but the moon had disappeared. And it was thought at the time that Peggy had actually been ejected into the void of space by gravity, or could have broken apart due to a collision. And there were a few faint uh, smears that were observed near uh, where it used to be, lending credence to the theory that it had collided and broken apart. The weird thing, though, is in 2016, it actually reappeared. Uh, one of the uh, those smears that I mentioned before was missing, and Peggy was back there. So Peggy disappeared and reappeared. Uh, we don't really know why exactly it reappeared, um, but it probably has to do with some complex dynamics of the, the motion of matter inside the rings of Saturn. Speaking of rings, another sort of mini-mystery and an update from last time is how many rings does Saturn have? Or more specifically, or generally, I guess, how many moons are in our solar system? Uh, now, the total number of moons for the largest planets in our solar system, Saturn and Jupiter, are plotted here on this chart. And as you can see, uh, they have grown um, more, even more than exponentially in the past few decades. Uh, most famously and interestingly, though, earlier this year, around May, it was announced that 63 new moons were confirmed and were to be added on to Saturn's total, bringing Saturn's current known moon count up to 146 known moons. Now, most of these moons are very tiny. The largest of this new crop of 63 moons is only three miles across. So it beg does beg the question what the limits of a moon are, and in the same way that back in 2006, uh, the International Astronomical Union had to get together to redefine what a planet was, and that's why Pluto was uh, demoted. I probably I anticipate sometime in the near future we may need to define a limit for what could be considered a moon, uh, as at some point we're going to be able to detect extremely tiny objects, and then Saturn and Jupiter may have thousands or even millions of moons. Uh, after all, if you consider the individual particles of ice that are orbiting inside of Saturn's rings, as potential moons themselves, then we'd be talking about um, billions or even trillions of moons. So there has to be a limit there somewhere. Uh, but for now, Saturn has 146 known moons. I am also anticipate Jupiter probably overtaking Saturn sometime in the near future, too. All right. Don't forget, if uh, there is anybody still watching, feel free to comment in the comment section and let me know you're watching. If you have any questions, be happy to answer them. Um, but for now, we're going to move on to another space mystery. This is one I didn't cover last time, but one of my favorites, uh, because it's just kind of a fun one. And this is the mystery of the wow signal. And here it is right there. There it is. <laughs> so uh, to give you some background, uh, in a 1959 paper, a Cornell University physicists, Philip Morrison and... Uh, Giuseppe uh, Co Coccioni, Coccioni? Hmm, I probably got that wrong, uh, they had speculated that uh, any extraterrestrial civilization attempting to communicate via radio signals might do so using a frequency, uh, or a specific frequency, in this case 1420 megahertz, um, which is naturally emitted by hydrogen, which is the most common element in the universe, and therefore likely familiar to all technologically advanced civilizations. Uh, in 1973, after completing an extensive survey of extragalactic radio sources, Ohio State University assigned the now defunct uh, Ohio State University Radio Observatory, nicknamed the Big Ear, uh, to, uh, to search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And they called this SETI, which stands for the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Now, in 1977, astronomer Jerry uh, Amon was working at the SETI project as a volunteer. Uh, his job was analyzing... Uh, by hand, large amounts of data processed by one of their early IBM computers and recording it on line printed paper. While he was looking at data collected from August 15th at about uh, 10 p.m., he spotted a series of values and of signal intensity and frequency that left him and his colleagues astonished. He was so, he was so impressed by these results that he circled them on the computer printout um, and he 
uh, wrote his in his handwriting his comment wow uh, which uh, led this signal to uh, being called the wow signal this event uh, was later documented in technical detail by the observatory's director uh, this string which is 6equj5 uh, and i have already checked to see if that's available as a license plate in missouri unfortunately it is not um this is commonly misinterpreted as a message encoded in the radio signal but it's actually not it's just uh, representing the fact that the signal's intensity variation over time uh, expressed in a particular measuring system adopted for the experiment uh, was significant. So again, just looking at these mostly low numbers, ones and twos, uh, this signal was significant, uh, although it doesn't actually mean anything. We can't decipher or translate those numbers and letters. Uh, the entire signal sequence lasted for a full 72 seconds, uh, during which the big ear was able to observe it but it has not been detected since, despite several subsequent attempts by the original scientists and others. Now, there are many other, are there many hypotheses, hypotheses about what could have caused this signal? Uh, in 2017, one astrophysicist proposed that the signal could have originated from a hydrogen cloud surrounding two comets. Um, but uh, this was dismissed by astronomers later um, because these specific comets that they were citing uh, were not actually in the the range of the beam at the correct time uh, plus comets don't emit so strongly uh, at the frequencies involved and there is no explanation for why a comet would be observed in one beam but not the other as they were observed in two beams of this radio telescope uh, now it was located in a region of the night sky um, uh, near a globular cluster called m55 near the constellation sagittarius as we pointed out earlier uh, and in 2022 there was a paper published uh, by the International Journal of Astrobiology that identified three likely sun-like stars within the antenna-pointed coordinates. And uh, in 2012, on the 35th anniversary of the WOW signal, uh, the Arecibo Observatory beamed a uh, digital stream towards uh, three other stars, uh, very similar to our sun with planets in habitable zones. Uh, this transmission considered, uh, consisted of approximately 10,000 Twitter messages um, solicited, solicited by the National Geographic Channel. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, perhaps our first signals to extraterrestrials will be Twitters, our tweets. Uh, I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, but uh, there it is. Um, but uh, for now, you know, we're going to continue searching. Um, this wow signal could have been a fluke, but perhaps it was just a little blip of a signal from extraterrestrial intelligence. Perhaps we'll never know, but pretty cool that there are still some mysteries when it comes to our search for other life. Another space mystery that I like to bring up is the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Um, the uh, black hole at the center of our galaxy is called Sagittarius A star. Uh, and let's see where, yeah. Uh, so let me actually bring up the black hole. Uh, forgot to load my program ahead of time. Um, but I'll talk a little bit in the meantime. Now, black holes are the result of the death of extremely massive stars. So I mentioned uh, that there are a couple different kinds of stars. There are small stars that burn for billions of years, uh, and they will uh, burn out in a planetary nebula like the Ring Nebula. And there are massive stars that will burn for only millions of years and go supernova. So uh, and now a supernova happens when uh, the all the matter and mass from uh, a star as it collapses crushes its core and it pushes all the subatomic particles into each other. And there's enough force that will bounce back and it have all that energy exploding back out into space. And that causes a supernova. Now occasionally there can be enough force that uh, even the bonds that keep subatomic particles apart will actually collapse and will uh, at that point we have a black hole um, So My program is still loading, but here's uh, ooh, there you go <laughs> Let me get this ready. Uh, so here's a little chart showing stellar evolution uh, And so we can see all stars begin as a nebula a big cloud of gas and dust like the Orion Nebula um, and smaller stars, we call them main sequence stars, they will turn into a red giant after about 10 billion years, and then they will uh, kind of peter out into a planetary nebula. But massive stars will go supernova and then either leave behind a neutron star or a black hole. 
So let's visit the black hole at the center of our galaxy. So we are uh, at Earth right now, uh, and this is in Space Engine, another 3D planetarium software. But we want to go to Sagittarius A star. Now this is near the constellation Sagittarius, as you might imagine. So uh, if we look over here, we can see the Milky Way galaxy in the distance, and we can see the teapot right here. Here's the handle of the teapot. It's lid and spout. Now the pointy spout actually points right at this black hole at the center of our galaxy. Um, but let's fly to it right now. Now black holes are actually fairly common. We estimate there are over a million of them in the Milky Way alone. And as I mentioned before, they come from massive stars when they die. But this black hole that we're visiting is quite unusual. Uh, because this black hole is millions of times more massive than any other object we've seen, any other black hole we've seen. Um, about four million times the mass of our sun, in fact. Now this black hole could not have been created in the typical ways that we understand. Um, so this black hole um, must have come from something else. Now there are a lot of theories about what could have formed this black hole. Uh, perhaps it was multiple smaller black holes colliding. But we knew that, and we do know uh, that uh, this object must be a black hole. Uh, and the reason we know it must be a black hole is because we can see a number of stars orbiting around it, and we can actually measure these stars' um, speed and positions, which will uh, then tell us their, uh, their mass, and it will also tell us the mass or the weight of the object that they are orbiting. And we can also see that some of these stars get really close to this black hole, now, for this object to be as massive as we measure it, but to be small enough that objects can orbit it, well, then it must be a black hole. Now, this is actually not a mystery. Uh, astronomers have calculated um, this, uh, this sort of measurement of how small an object uh, must be before it turns into a black hole. We call it a Schwarzschild, Schwarzschild radius. There's actually a fun calculator online. You can calculate the radius of various objects. So, for example, if we wanted to figure out um, it, how small we would have to compress our sun for it to turn into a black hole, and we could type that in. So basically, oops, uh, if we um, if we took all the matter in our sun and compressed it to a ball that was less than two miles across, then the forces that actually keep subatomic particles, the forces that keep neutrons themselves apart from each other, would break down, and our sun would turn into a black hole. We could calculate. Uh, how many or how small the Earth would uh, uh, be if we wanted to turn into a black hole, uh, and it would be pretty tiny. Go back here. Uh, so if we took the mass of the Earth and compressed it to a uh, space about a third of an inch across, then the Earth would turn into a black hole. Uh, humans would have a Schwarzschild radius too, but it's so small we probably couldn't measure it. Um, but it's just kind of cool knowing that pretty much anything could turn into a black hole as long as you have enough force to compress its mass into a small enough space. Uh, and here's a diagram showing that type of force. Um, so when a small star dies, uh, the electrons at the center uh, are able to kind of stay apart from the nuclei of the atoms and what's left is what's called a white dwarf. Um, and so the star doesn't collapse, it's just its inert core is left over. But uh, when a larger star collapses, the electrons get forced into the nuclei of the atoms and that leaves behind a neutron star, a ball that is just neutrons. But as I said, if there's enough force, then even the neutrons can't stay apart and they can smash into a single point, a singularity, which is a black hole. But as I mentioned, most black holes are accounted for. Most black holes come from this process of stellar evolution. Our black hole at the center of our galaxy does not, though. Um, now, here is uh, some uh, cool animations showing us actually uh, measuring the movement of these stars at the center of our galaxy, the stars that are orbiting our black hole. There are quite a few of them. Uh, as of 2020, the star S4714 is the current record holder of closest approach to this black hole. It gets about 12 astronomical units away from the black hole, which is almost as close as Saturn gets to our sun, although this star is traveling at about 8% the speed of light, which is a significant speed. Uh, in May of... Oh, oh and here's a... Oh, uh, 
that's what I want to show. Uh, in May of 2022, astronomers actually released the first image of the black hole at the center of our galaxy. This is using a telescope called the Event Horizon Telescope, which is a telescope made up of multiple um, telescopes around the world, creating basically a virtual telescope the size of our planet. Um, we actually first took a picture of a black hole in a different galaxy, a Messier 87, back in 2019. But in 2022, we were able to get this picture of our own black hole, our own supermassive black hole. And so this is Sagittarius A star. Now, it looks like a bit of a fuzzy picture. But again, as perspective, we're looking at the black hole at the center of our galaxy, 26,000 light years away. So it's a miracle we can get any detail at all. Uh, this picture shows a comparison between our black hole, Sagittarius A star, and you can see how big that black hole is, pretty much as big as Mercury's orbit. Uh, but then the black hole at the center of M87, the other galaxy, is even larger. In fact, it's bigger than our entire solar system. Um, so uh, although the black hole at the center of our galaxy is massive, this uh, there are other black holes out there that are, that are even bigger. And ast again, astronomers have no idea how those black holes got there. All right, so we are uh, going to take a quick break and check into the comment section. Looks like we've got a bunch of comments uh, from our watchers. So thanks everybody for your patience if I missed your comment. We've got Amy watching, uh, Amy and Quincy watching from Leavenworth. Uh, thanks for tuning in tonight. They say the live stream is awesome. Well, you guys are awesome. Thanks for watching. We've got Laura saying hi from Oak Grove and Eric is asking, what is the current definition of a moon? Hopefully I kind of answered that question. Uh, but really the answer is there is no current definition. Um, essentially a moon, a natural satellite, as we call them scientifically, is any body that is naturally forming that is orbiting a planet. So something that's not orbiting the sun, but is orbiting another planet. Um, that includes bodies that are orbiting other bodies. So we did a live stream a while ago where I talked about some of my favorite moons and there are actually um, some uh, asteroids that are orbiting other asteroids. So there are moons of moons too, uh, but essentially a moon is, or a natural satellite, is any object that is orbiting another object in space that is not a star. That makes sense. And Christy is asking how small can a moon be before it is not a moon? Again, uh, we are, we don't currently have any limit to that definition, uh, but as our, uh, our uh, telescopes and detectors get uh, so good that we can start detecting these objects that are less than a mile across, Again, astronomers are probably going to have to get together at some point and define the limits of what a moon is. We've got Kimberly watching from Shawnee, Kansas. Thanks for watching tonight, Kimberly. Whitney's watching from Lawrence. Thanks for sharing all this. Absolutely, Whitney. Glad you're watching tonight. We've got James uh, uh, saying, loving the physics. I really like how you're explaining the subject. Awesome, James. Uh, Jamie, I'm glad you're watching tonight. I appreciate you tuning in. Uh, and Anthony is watching from the Co-op down in downtown Kansas City. Awesome. Uh, well, uh, I don't know if you're watching this with the volume, volume on, but uh, thanks for watching. And if you are, then hello to everybody down at the Co-op. I hope you guys are having a good time. All right. Uh, so let's move right along. Ooh, wow. It's already six, almost 6.50. Um, we are uh, going to be... Wrapping up sometime soon. I've just got, it looks like, four more space mysteries I want to cover. So stick around, folks. Uh, my next space mystery is the mystery of dark matter and dark energy. Uh, so first of all, dark matter and dark energy aren't actually things. Um, they are not things that we know their origin. They're basically placeholders. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So dark matter, let's start with, um, was first sort of discovered um, back when uh, we started observing galaxies. And when we observed distant galaxies, we started to be able to measure things about them. We were able to measure their mass, for example, by uh, essentially sort of counting their stars, not actually counting, but by measuring their brightness um, compared to our known measurements of stars and, and nebulas and things like that. We were, we, were, we were able to measure how heavy these distant galaxies were by uh, what we could see, essentially. They're visible... Um, or not even just visible, but any uh, infrared radiation, any light, um, visible or otherwise, we could detect that and we can measure how heavy the galaxy was. But another way we can measure how heavy a galaxy is is by measuring how fast it's spinning. So using some physics uh, formulas, we can actually measure or we can observe the galaxy spinning and then we can, um, we can deduce how much energy is in that uh, or how much matter is uh, giving the galaxy enough energy to rotate at that speed. Now, there's a problem, though, because when we compare these two numbers, we, they should be the same, right? 
the heaviness, the mass of a galaxy based on what we can see should be the same as based on how fast it's spinning. But that is not the case. Um, as you can see here on the left, this is kind of what we'd expect a spinning galaxy to look like based on how heavy we can see it is. But galaxies spin a lot faster um, than they should. So for them to be spinning faster, there needs to be some sort of matter in these uh, galaxies that is uh, causing this this rotational velocity. But this matter is not giving off any light, any uh, ra radiation that we can see with our eyes or with uh, our best instruments. And so there is some matter that is dark, too dark for us to observe. So we call it dark matter. So again, dark matter is not a thing that we can touch. It's not a thing we can even really measure except for its, uh, its uh, emptiness or its um, you know, the gaps in our measurement, basically. it's There's some variable out there that should be accounting for uh, this extra rotational velocity. So it's there, but we can't see it. Um, it doesn't interact with electromagnetic radiation. It doesn't absorb, reflect, or emit light, um, but we can observe its effects, so how matter moves around it. Now, there are a number of theories about, about dark matter, um, and some of these theories go all the way into quantum mechanics. Um, some people think there is this class of particles called supersymmetric particles. Um, and the particle accelerator at CERN is doing experiments to try to create this dark matter. Um, but uh, in the meantime, we don't know its origins. Um, by the way, to measure how fast these galaxies are moving, we use something called the Doppler shift, um, which basically, uh, if you've ever heard an ambulance or police car drive by you, you may have heard uh, the sound of its siren kind of change pitch. Um, that's because sound behaves in waves and light also behaves in waves. So you can see a galaxy here, and if a galaxy is moving away from us, or part of a galaxy is moving away from us as it's rotating, then its light will be sort of stretched out and shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. We call this red shift. Uh, and if a galaxy is moving towards us, we say that it is blue shifted. And so by measuring the light from this galaxy and how far left or right it is on our spectrum, we can detect how fast it's moving. Now, dark matter is not the only mystery out there. There's also dark energy. Um, now, the universe is expanding, and we can observe this using redshift. When we look at distant galaxies, we can see that they're moving away from us. Um, and we don't really know why the universe is expanding, but we know it's been expanding for a long time. Um, but the bigger mystery, though, is not only is the universe expanding, but it is accelerating in that expansion. Um, now, so again, it is expanding, but the rate at which it's expanding is getting faster and faster and faster. And because of what we know about physics, for something to be accelerating, there must be energy being added into the system. And this energy is something that we can't observe. So this we call dark energy. So this dark energy uh, is, um, is all over the universe. In fact, a very recent study um, uh, that was uh, published just this April showed that uh, dark matter is distributed evenly throughout our universe. I won't get into all the details, but I like citing my sources sometimes. Uh, this study looked at galaxy clusters. Uh, it was published earlier this year, and it, uh, again, confirms that dark energy is spread evenly throughout space and time. And galaxy clusters uh, were used to study this effect. And they're useful for understanding dark energy because on really large scales, uh, this odd repellent sort of anti-gravity force should suppress the formation of these big cosmic structures. Um, so dark energy uh, determines how and where galaxy clusters, the largest objects in our universe, can form. Um, also, the results of the study uh, when, uh, were then compared to other theoretical predictions, and it confirmed that dark energy accounts for around 76% of the total energy density of the universe. So if we split up our universe, observable matter that we can see uh, every single star and galaxy out there in the universe that is observable only accounts for about 4% of what we can measure the universe is made out of. Dark matter accounts for about 21% of that. And then dark energy is, uh, again, this chart says 74, but the recent study I just shared showed that around 76% of the entire universe is dark energy. So dark matter and dark energy are mysterious, but as our understandings of physics continue to expand, things may fill in those gaps and we may be answering some of these questions and dark matter may not be dark matter anymore. We may be able to say 
what this matter is. There are some theories about dark matter specifically, like perhaps it could be dark planets that aren't visible to the naked eye, but are just sort of floating around in distant galaxies um, that don't have stars or, uh, to orbit or anything like that. But we don't really know. All right, back in the comments, we've got Carrie watching from Lee Summit. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Carrie, I hope you're enjoying the show. And we've got Rusty watching, saying, hey, Patrick, Patrick, I really enjoy watching you show us the universe. Well, thanks, Rusty. I'm glad you're tuning in tonight. And if you have any questions, please let me know. I love answering everyone's questions about space, and I know you'll have some good ones. But thanks for watching. Here's another fun new space mystery that uh, came out relatively recently. And now, despite being one of the most famous and prominent objects in the night sky, visible um, through, uh, throughout the summer and fall, the Andromeda Galaxy still has some surprises. Now, I'm going to bring our, uh, let's see, I'm going to bring Stellarium back up. I should have mentioned the Andromeda Galaxy, but I glossed over it. So I'm going to bring our stargazing software back. All right, so back over here. Uh, and we're going to be seeing this over in the northeast. So the Andromeda Galaxy is near the constellation Andromeda, uh, which is going to be right over here. It looks kind of like a, a banana peel. It's behind this W-shaped constellation, Cassiopeia. Um, we can throw... Uh, nope. There we go. Let's do it this way. So Andromeda, constellation there. But the Andromeda Galaxy is uh, near Andromeda's waist, and it's a deep space object that's actually sometimes visible to the naked eye. It is the closest spiral galaxy to the Milky Way galaxy, and some people call it the Milky Way's big sister galaxy. It's the closest spiral galaxy to us, uh, and it is so close that it's actually, uh, it would be six times as wide as the moon if we could see it next to the moon in our night sky. So it's a very familiar pattern. Again, one of the few deep space objects visible to the naked eye um, a, a very familiar object, I should say, but it does still have some mysteries. Now this we are seeing right here is, um, uh, I believe, a, a, a either visible light or an interpreted, uh, you know, look at infrared light, but common light we can see from the Andromeda Galaxy, light that we've been able to observe for hundreds of years. In fact, um, we first imaged uh, Andromeda all the way back in 1887. Now, uh, let me show you, actually, this is pretty cool. Um, but back in the 1800s, we actually took uh, a picture of uh, the Andromeda galaxy. So here is the first picture of Andromeda. So we've been looking at Andromeda for literally over 100 years, but it still has some mysteries to provide. So uh, this is a brand new picture of the Andromeda galaxy. And um, this was actually uh, created from a group of amateur astronomers. And they discovered a previously unknown nebula that was lying very close to Andromeda. And it actually spans half the width of the galaxy, the galaxy itself. So that's this blue streak right here. So it's crazy that we've been observing the Andromeda galaxy for over 100 years, but nobody's noticed this nebula next to it. Now this uh, feature was discovered in images taken last year with an oxygen-3 filter by French astronomer Jan Sainty, who worked with uh, Marcel Dreschler and Javier uh, Strautner, uh, to process and analyze this data. Uh, they have designated the feature the Strautner Dreschler Safety Object number one. Um, I hope they've come up with a more interesting name in the future, but uh, there it is. Uh, they, uh, after this, they worked with a team of professional astronomers and other astro imagers to confirm this find, just to make sure it wasn't just a smudge on their lens. And then they published their results in the American Astronomical Society's journal in January of this year, as well as this stunning a highly processed image. Now this find has set the astronomical community ablaze with speculation about the object's nature, um, including whether it's actually next to Andromeda, which is about two and a half million light years away, or perhaps it's closer to us in the foreground or even further away in the background. Uh, it's entirely possible that this object is actually part of our own galaxy and is just sort of in our line of sight, um, but it is possible that it is connected to the Andromeda galaxy in some way. Um, the, the team wrote, or the team of astronomers studying it wrote that, quote, the arc seems much too close to Andromeda to fit uh, the picture that um, it would, wouldn't be connected to it. More likely, it lies within the Andromeda galaxy's halo and is related to the numerous stellar streams, especially the giant stellar stream whose eastern edge lies close 
to this O3 arc. So essentially, there are a number of jet streams of uh, matter and energy that are coming from Andromeda, and they're saying that this streak uh, seems to be close to one of these, and so it may actually be coming from Andromeda. Uh, to settle this issue, uh, astronomers hope to obtain a spectrum with professional grade uh, observation, and from this they can measure Doppler shift, as we mentioned before, which will tell us uh, this structure's motion if it's traveling with the Andromeda galaxy or moving relative to the Milky Way galaxy. So we should know soon enough whether this streak is part of Andromeda or not, but it's still cool that there are some parts of space that uh, are still a mystery, just like Earth's oceans. They're right there in our backyard, but um, we only explored a tiny bit of them, and that rings true for our universe. Uh, so, what was the universe like at its beginning? And this is a mystery that is being studied right now by the James Webb Space Telescope. So since the last time we did our Space Mystery live stream, the James Webb Space Telescope has been launched and deployed. And the Webb Telescope's entire design is to study the early universe. Now, we, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, recently took a picture of one of the earliest galaxies ever discovered. Uh, here it is. <laughs> Lovely picture, right? Um, but uh, this is pretty groundbreaking, and as I explained, and hopefully you'll be a little more amazed uh, than just this blurry pixel uh, will, uh, will make you. But this galaxy, which is nicknamed Maisie's Galaxy, was born less than 400 million years after the Big Bang. And it is officially one of the four oldest galaxies ever discovered, revealed by the James Webb Space Telescope in August of this year, just a few months ago. It may not look like much in this image. Uh, it looks sort of like a glowing orange blob. But Maisie's Galaxy shows that when it comes to space, appearances can be deceiving. Uh, this is one of the first objects captured by the powerful James Webb Space Telescope in the summer of 2022, right after it was deployed. Um, and here's sort of a zoomed-in picture. This was part of its original deep field, one of the first images that was revealed. And uh, we can zoom way in on it and to see that a little splotch. Again, that is an entire galaxy with presumably hundreds of thousands, if not millions of stars. Now, scientists recently confirmed precisely how old the universe was uh, during the point at which we see Maisie's galaxy, because the farther away we look, the farther back in time we look, because the light from Maisie's galaxy has taken 13.8 billion years to get to us. Uh, so it is very, very old. Uh, this galaxy existed uh, when our uh, our universe was only about 390 million years old, which is pretty young compared to the our universe's 14 billion year age. Um, now, Maisie's galaxy would be distinguishable from galaxies in the universe today, including the Milky Way, as it is much smaller than galaxies as we know today. Uh, the size is because of the dense state of the universe back then. In this epoch of cosmic history, everything in the universe was in a much tighter space, much more densely packed uh, one astronomer said this, quote, The universe was quite active when Maisie's galaxies was, galaxy was seen because it was a lot smaller than it was today, so everything was squished in a much smaller volume. Uh, also, galaxies were closer together then and merging much more frequently. Because the universe was only around 400 million years old at this time, essentially all the stars that are around uh, are young, so there are, were a lot more brighter and bluer stars than we see in galaxies today. Uh, the blueness of these stars is confusing. This picture itself is false color, so um, the stars themselves are blue, but the image we're seeing is kind of orangish. But the blueness of the stars in Maisie's galaxy um, show that this galaxy is low in heavy elements and has a primordial, primordial composition of mostly hydrogen and helium. Maisie's galaxy is also much brighter than astronomers expected from an early galaxy, a feature that is also being found with other galaxies observed by the James Webb Space Telescope. So as we uncover some of the mysteries of our early universe, new mysteries join uh, them as well. And so uh, the Webb Space Telescope is going to continue exploring the origins of our universe, but I'm guessing even more questions are going to be asked than are going to be answered. But you know what? That's exciting in science. All right, we are coming to the conclusion of tonight's stream. I only have one more space mystery to share. So if you're still watching and you have any comments or questions, anything you want to share, please jump into the comment section in the next few minutes because we will be wrapping up soon. But for our final space mystery, uh, it, it is going to be one of the biggest space mysteries out there. And that mystery is, are we alone in the universe? Is there life outside of the Earth? 
Now, mathematicians and physicists have calculated that there is a high probability that there is extraterrestrial life. We have found at least 50 exoplanets in a Goldilocks zone of, of their stars uh, out of 4,000 confirmed planets. So roughly 1% of the planets we've found are likely in a very habitable zone. Not too hot, not too cold, a place that seems like it could be good to support life. Doing that math on the number of sun-like stars in our galaxy, it's estimated that there could be upwards of 6 billion Earth-like planets in our Milky Way alone. Our galaxy is one of over hundreds of millions of galaxies, each with billions of stars, and so again, the math says that there must be other planets like Earth out there. So, where is all the life? And this is what we call the Fermi Paradox, where basically, if we do the math, it seems like, well, of course there must be life out there, but where could it be? And there are a number of explanations as to why we haven't seen life yet. You know, perhaps we haven't found evidence of life uh, because our reality is an illusion and we live in a simulation. Um, a bit of a crazier explanation, but, you know, some people seem to subscribe to that. I've seen The Matrix. Um, perhaps there is alien life already here. Uh, perhaps it's so similar to Earth that we would not notice it and uh, we wouldn't even register this life. Um, you know, perhaps it's also so different uh, that, you know, we, we wouldn't even recognize it. You know, when we think about alien life, we think about little green men with, you know, two eyeballs, a mouth and a nose. But uh, what's more likely is that life developed on other planets completely differently. I mean, if you look at life on Earth, there's a huge diversity. Uh, and if, you know, an alien species saw a human next to a jellyfish, would they think that they both came from the same planet? It's hard to say, They but those are still both examples of life. You know, perhaps we're sending the wrong types of transmissions to space. I mentioned before that we sent 10,000 tweets into space about a decade ago, uh, but perhaps uh, aliens are using MySpace still. So maybe there are other ways that we have to contact extraterrestrials or more likely we're using the wrong types of radio, fre radio frequencies, or maybe there are other ways to communicate that we aren't able to communicate with. Maybe gravitational waves are the, the radio waves of aliens and there's no way for us yet to send those signals out. And perhaps we're living in an unlikely place. Perhaps there's part of the universe that are, is in sort of a dark spot or um, sort of out of the way. You know, maybe we're, we're way off the beaten path for aliens and there's no reason for them to come out to us. Uh, our solar system is about two thirds of the way out to the edge of our galaxy. So maybe we're just sort of in a place that aliens don't really think to look because there isn't a lot of life out here. There are a lot of different explanations um, you know, alien life might be just so rare and for it to develop at all, let alone get to a space-faring uh, time of civilization that, you know, um, they call it the Great Filter, where maybe all these alien civilizations never reach the point where they can reach other ones. Um, another explanation that I, I like thinking about is that, well, maybe aliens just came at the wrong time. Humans have only been around for a, about 100,000 years, and even then, for only about 10,000 years, have we actually been recording history or able to communicate with uh, people, you know, other groups of people. Uh, so if aliens stopped by a million years ago or a hundred million years ago, they would have seen some dinosaurs lying around and they would have thought, there's no intelligent life here, so they would have just kept on moving. So the Earth, or, or the Earth is very old, four billion years old, and humans have only been around for just the tiniest fraction of the Earth's history. And so if aliens stop by at any of other point in Earth's history, then, you know, they would have missed us, basically. Um, so there are a lot of theories out there. And uh, one of the theories that uh, I, I like to uh, bring up and think about, although it's a bit of a depressing theory, uh, was actually in one of my favorite books. And this is uh, a book called The Dark Forest. It's the sequel to uh, The Three Body Problem. Uh, which is a really good uh, trilogy of books. Uh, and in the Dark Forest, there is a hypothesis about why um, alien life hasn't reached out to us yet. Uh, and it's all in the title of the book. So here's the quote from the book, and this will be the last thing I leave you with for tonight's stream. But imagine the universe as a dark forest. You can imagine every civilization as an armed hunter stalking through the trees like a ghost gently pushing aside branches that block the path and trying to tread without sound. Even breathing is done with care. The hunter has to be careful because everywhere in the forest are other stealthy hunters like him. If he finds other life, uh, it could be another hunter, or it could be an angel or a demon, a delicate infant, a tottering old man, a fairy, or a demigod. The only thing that this being can do is to eliminate this other life form. In the forest, 
it's so dark that any other uh, any other life is a danger. And so an eternal threat uh, that any life that exposes its own existence will be swiftly swiftly wiped out. And so in this book series, In the Dark Forest, this is their explanation of the Fermi Paradox, that there is life out there, but because of these vast distances and because of being unable to communicate, the uh, the only thing you can do, the only reaction you can have to finding life in the universe is to destroy it. And so all life in the universe tries to be as quiet as possible. So keep that in mind as we're sending tweets out into space. Perhaps we don't want to communicate with extraterrestrials. Um, but, uh, you know, for now, we're going to keep sending those tweets and we'll see if any signals come back. So we're going to start wrapping up tonight's stream. Uh, in the comments, Christy says, is asking, what is the closest exoplanet to us? And that's a great question, uh, Christy. Um, uh, and I'm going to look it up uh, because it often changes. And so the closest exoplanet uh, that we know of, oh, of course, I should know this. Um, the, uh, so the closest star to us is uh, called Proxima Centauri. It's part of a multiple star system. Uh, that uh, Alpha Centauri is part of near the Centauri constellation, the Centaur. Um, and it is a very close star, a very close star system, about four light years away, so extremely close. Uh, and we do know that there are exoplanets. There are planets orbiting these stars, specifically um, the Proxima Centauri star. Uh, and here's a cool uh, website link about it from NASA, NASA's Exoplanet Explor Exploration um, website. Now, this is an artist's interpretation of this potential exoplanet, but it's four light years away, and it is the closest known exoplanet. It's what we call a super-Earth, um, which uh, is a little bit different than Earth uh, and not quite as green and habitable as you might imagine. Uh, it's about 1.27 times the mass of Earth. It takes about 11 days to complete an orbit of its star versus the 365 days that our uh, planet takes. Uh, and its discovery was announced relatively recently in 2016. Uh, now, it is in the habitable zone, but it encounters bouts of extreme ultraviolet radiation hundreds of times greater than the Earth does. Uh, and this radiation generates enough energy to strip away not just the lightest molecules like hydrogen, but also heavier ones like oxygen and nitrogen, which means this planet probably does not have an atmosphere. But it is still cool knowing that there is a known planet just four light years away from us. Um, so pretty cool stuff. And, uh, you know, there may be conditions on this planet that could support other forms of life, life that we don't quite understand. But the way we understand it, that doesn't seem like a very habitable planet. But there are other ones that are close by uh, that are more habitable. Um, let's see what the closest habitable planet might be. Uh, let's see. So there is a planet... Uh, let's see, about 16 light years away. That seems to be a little bit more comfortable um, in the habitable zone, another super Earth. Um, so, you know, things that are relatively close and if we are able to travel uh, even close to the speed of light or a fraction of the speed of light, perhaps some future generations of humans could explore these distant worlds. So thanks for that question, Christy. And thanks to everyone who has watched tonight's live stream. Uh, don't forget, this is a part of our wrap-up of our live streams. We are approaching 100 streams, and it has been an amazing ride over the past almost four years. Uh, and for tonight's 97th stream, we've dived into a number of amazing space mysteries. Our next live stream uh, will be uh, sometime in late November or early December. We've not announced a date for it, but it should be a fun one. I won't spoil the surprise, but it will be a little bit about celestial navigation. Um, but for now, I have been your planetary manager, Patrick Hess. Uh, here's my assistant, Phoebe, who is stopping by to say goodbye to everybody. Uh, so I'll stick around in the comments for just a second. But thank you all so much for watching tonight. Hope you have a wonderful Halloween, uh, and hope you stay warm. And uh, I hope you enjoy the lovely little tweets from Phoebe. Or Scratch. Scratch. Scratch, indeed. Phoebe? Scratch. Scratch. <laughs> Play us off, Phoebe. Scratch. 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 Phoebe? Scratch? How about kisses? Scratch. No, give me kisses. Boop. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching tonight. Bye bye.